The storm raven hurtled through the skies towards its target like a lightning bolt. Through fields of fire, flak and small arms aimed up at it. Most was evaded by the furious action of the incredibly skilled pilot. He was used to the task, delivering his fallen brothers to the very center of the fray, its very heart. But he always kept the comms from the central section turned off. On his first drop, he had kept them on, but the lesson had been learned. Oh, how it had been learned. For he had heard what they said. He heard what was being spat at them by the legendary Lemartes, guardian of the lost. And on that day, he near lost the command of his faculties. He nearly fell into the chasm that was the rage. Now he thought only on his task, had to concentrate on this one moment. For even the memory of those words would threaten his soul again. Inside the main compartment of the specially altered assault vessel, the same thing was happening as it always did when it was deployed. Le Martis was with his brothers of the Death Company. He was whipping them into a froth of rage that would make even a coronate berserker take pause. The forces of our enemy, the Great Betrayer, await us, brothers! We have but moments before we are unleashed! Remember the faces of the foes you slay today. Remember when you strike what they have done. They have betrayed the Emperor. They have betrayed the Crusade. They have betrayed humanity. These lapdogs and lick spittles of Horus and his vile ilk. These traitors deserve the fullest extent of our wrath. The sons of the Angel. The sons of the Emperor. These vile curs are without honor, without courage, without virtue, without glory, without any redeeming feature. For they are the basest of all things. They are vile and deserve our righteous fury. They deserve the cut of our chain swords, the blessing of our bolters. They deserve to be crushed underfoot, and we shall give it to them. For they are the most despicable thing ever to arise from the human race. They are traitors! They betrayed our lord, the angel. They betray our master, the emperor. They betray our entire race. They cavort there beneath the very walls of the imperial palace, looking for a way in, looking to slay and slaughter our brothers who guard that mighty and hallowed wall. They look to lay their rough and unclean hands on the emperor himself. Shall we allow this? Do we permit these vile scum to bray and bluster at our very walls? Do we allow them their nefarious scheme? Do we allow them to defile the halls of the Emperor? Do we allow them to hack and claw and spit on our very Primarch, our father, on Sanguinius himself? Do we allow them to trample his image, to wipe their boots on his wings? Do we allow them to defecate on his body? Do we allow them to then slay our Emperor? Do we? Then buckle your bolters and let's rip thy swords and chain thy fury, thy wrath, for this day we will destroy the traitors. The cabin hummed with the whir of chain swords as the light turned green at the hatch and it was swiftly thrown open. Some fifty feet beneath were densely packed a veritable sea of enemies. None wore the power armor of the named traitors, none the emblems of chaos, but to the men who jumped from the Storm Raven right into their midst, there was nothing but the images of the sons of Horus overlaid onto their true visage. As the Death Company carved a bloody path through their opposition, their arms moving faster than was deemed possible by their foe, wounds that would have killed even Astartes, severed limbs, broken bones, did nothing but fuel their rage. Nothing stopped them as they carved through the madness-induced illusions of what they now saw as the traitor mass. Forms that would soon all be dead as the wrath of the Death Company chewed through their ranks like whirlwinds of unstoppable rage.
Welcome, gentle listener. I am Voldemort, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and important units of the Warhammer 40k universe. Today, let us look at one of the most iconic and exciting, yet romantically doomed, of all of the units under the command of the Imperium, the Death Company. The Death Company are a unit of Adeptus Astartes, Space Marines, that is totally unique to the Ninth Legion, the Blood Angels. They are present in all of the successor chapters that were separated from the Legion on the second founding, as the curse is something that not only runs through their veins, but is an echo in their very souls. Souls that are irrevocably tied to the curse the second that the gene seed enters their body, and the human aspirant becomes a space marine of the Blood Angels. In the near future, I shall go into more detail about one of the most loved chapters in the grim darkness of the future, the Blood Angels, but today is not that day. Trust me though, I shall endeavor to make this one of my most potent entries, as I make no bones about being an ardent fan of this mighty and noble legion. Now, as this is an introduction to the Death Company only, let us lean on existing wisdom for the heart of the matter. To quote, the Death Company. The Death Company crash through the enemy ranks like a black armored battering ram. Drawn from all ranks of the chapter, they are united in their terminal ferocity, shrugging off wounds that would normally slay a battle brother thrice over and reaping one last tally of slain foes before madness or death claims them forever. In order to keep the Black Rage in check, on the eve of battle, the Blood Angels bend their thoughts to prayer and to the sacrifice of their Primarch so many centuries ago. Chaplains move from man to man, blessing each in turn, and noting those amongst the Brotherhood whose eyes may appear a little glazed, or whose speech is slurred or overly excited. Some, almost all, overcome this ancient intrusion into their minds, much of these warriors' training is directed at controlling it, beating it down into the depths of their being. But for some, the imprint of Sanguinius is too strong, the memories too loud and demanding. As the chaplains chant the Moripatis, the Mass of Doom, the Chosen Ones collapse into the arms of their priests and are taken away to form a special unit called the Death Company. The madness that overcomes these unfortunates is of a very specific sort. In the mind of each fallen brother, the millennia fall away and they find themselves embroiled in the last great battle of the Horus Heresy. Some may believe they defend the walls of the Emperor's palace, perceiving even tyrannid bio-horrors or blade-limbed Tukari as traitor legionnaires hell-bent on toppling the Golden Throne. Others may believe that they are Sanguinius himself fighting to hold back the traitor tide or forging through the horrors of Horus's battle barge. Whatever the case, the Battle Brothers' mind accommodates their surroundings and foes into this delusion, casting them adrift upon tides of madness and stranding them beyond time and hope forevermore. The warriors of the Death Company seek only one thing, death in battle, and they are sent forth to their final fight with great honor. Each brother is arrayed in black armor, blazoned with blood-red saltiers, to symbolize the wounds of Sanguinius during the last battle against Horus. Their ceramite plates are hung with scrolls that proclaim deeds performed and honors earned before the onset of madness. From the moment a battle brother dons the sepulchral armor of the Death Company, he is a dead man walking, lost forever to his chapter, but to be remembered eternally in its histories. Members of the Death Company fight with no thought for their own survival, and the furious willpower lent them by the Black Rage renders them nigh impervious to killing wounds. Under the watchful eye of the chapter's chaplains, the Lost Brothers of the Death Company know glory beyond even the ken of their battle brothers, fighting against terrible odds in one final service to their chapter. Many of the Blood Angels' greatest victories have followed a shattering assault by the Death Company. There are few enemies who can hope to stay the onset of such maddened warriors, let alone repel their assault. On Antax, Melianeth, Honnan, Armageddon, and other worlds too numerous to mention, the Death Company have more than lived up to their name, and legends of their ferocity have long since spread to worlds where the Blood Angels have never even trod. 
Yet, as with all such glories, a price must be paid, either on the bloody ground of the battlefield or in the fleeting calm of victory. Those few members of the Death Company that survive the battle perish shortly afterwards, either of their fearsome wounds or through the mercy of the Redeemer of the Lost, whose duty it is to end the suffering. It is better this way. For those who do survive almost always fall victim to the Red Thirst, turning into creatures no better than wild beasts, craving flesh and blood. The dread tower of Amarillo on Baal echoes with the howls and roars of those luckless degenerates, locked away for their own safety and that of their former battle brothers. Better by far to die cleanly and quickly than to suffer such an ignoble fate. End quote. So we now see that the Death Company are those blood angels who have finally succumbed to the Black Rage. But for you to understand the initial story and the realities of their fracture in time, one must understand the Siege of Terror. For this, I would advise you watch the entry I performed for Rogal Dawn, as this contains more information as to how it all led to the siege and the situation that unfolded in that time. But of course, it is a long entry and not for everyone, so do be kind if it is not to your tastes. I can never, ever, ever get everything right or please everyone. Just know that the very palace of the Emperor, the master of mankind, was beset by the forces of the legions of space marines that had turned traitor in the event 10,000 years before the current setting, an event known as the Horus Heresy. It was the Blood Angels and the Imperial Fist Legion, despite being outnumbered three to one, that held the palace against the tide of traitor marines and their dark demonic summonations. Assisted, as always, by he who some always forget, the Great Khan. But the Khan was outside the walls, and it was the Blood Angels and Imperial Fists who were holding them. When a battle brother of the Blood Angels falls to the Black Rage, they believe they are reliving those dark days and that the traitor legions are baying at the very gates. Another form of the Black Rage is the visions of Sanguinius from his time on the Vengeful Spirit. Again, I shall go into more detail on this, as time permits. But the Black Rage is ever-present and a constant struggle for any who are sired by the blood of the Angel, a curse from a demon called Kabanda, some say a demon directly from the blood god Corn, and it is a tragedy without compare. For the Legion was originally a thing of terror, a thing of horror, that was curbed and brought to a state of honour by the discovery and subsequent leadership of the Primarch Sanguinius. He made a thing of butchery into a thing of light, an army of noble sacrifice and bold courage. When the rage strikes, it is as if all of the honour and light that was brought to the Legion by the Angel is burned away, and the beast within is all that remains. But it is then harnessed, as we have heard. For how it is harnessed, that powerful orator we heard in the brief story, I would again like to lean on existing wisdom, for I cannot match it. But also, I would like us to know how the Blood Angels deal with this curse, how it is kept from the eyes of the Inquisition and general population alike. So here too will be presented the entry for Astaroth the Grim, the Redeemer of the Lost. Astaroth the Grim, Redeemer of the Lost. Astaroth the Grim is the Blood Angel's High Chaplain and Redeemer of the Lost. There is no rank within the chapter more greatly honoured or more deeply loathed. Honoured for the burden the Redeemer of the Lost bears, and for the essential duty he performs. Loathed, because the duty is stained forever with the blood of his battle brothers. It is Astaroth's calling to seek out those amongst the scions of Sanguinius whose souls have been claimed by the Black Rage, and whose mental degeneration has become so severe that even death in battle is no longer possible. His quarry found, Astaroth ends his lost brother's life with a single mighty blow to the neck from the ill-omened weapon known as the Executioner's Axe. This is without doubt an act of mercy, a gift to the cursed. Nonetheless, no battle brother can ever feel entirely comfortable in Astaroth's presence, for they know that the bite of his forbidding axe might one day be the last thing that they feel. While officially bound to the Blood Angels, Astaroth's task carries him far and wide amongst the chapter's successors, 
it was long ago considered that these terrible duties were best borne by a single brother, and thus far at least, a single brother has been equal to the task at hand. So does Astaroth tread the stars, hacking apart those enemies who would prevent him from bestowing his gift of oblivion. To an observer, it might perhaps seem that Astaroth's presence fans the destructive fires of the Black Rage. Certainly, it is more prevalent wherever he treads, and even those blood angels who are yet sane are unmistakably wilder in the Redeemer's presence. However, the truth is entirely opposite. Astorath can sense the Black Rage's degenerative onset before it becomes apparent to any other soul, including its victim. Individual afflictions echo through his mind in the form of doom-laden chords and grow ever stronger as other Battle Brothers fall into the Black Rage's clutches. No separation of distance can serve to mute this dolorous symphony, a somber orchestra that only Astorath can hear. Whether the victims are fighting on Armageddon or in Ultramar, Astorath can sense their plight, and he must go to them, as his duty requires. So it is that the Redeemer of the Lost has become a true angel of death to his foes and his battle brothers alike, a legend of destruction amongst the Blood Angel's successor chapters and their enemies both. Wherever Astorath the Grim treads, the enemy face not only his fury, but the onslaught of space marines caught in the twilight shadows of the Black Rage. Astaroth's sorrow for his doomed battle brother serves only to fuel a determination that they shall pass into death, having known one last great victory. In this cause, he fights like a man possessed, resolute that his twin gifts of death and redemption shall not be denied. End quote. To quote, Lemartes, Guardian of the Lost. Chaplain Lamartis fell to the Black Rage amidst the preparations to liberate Hadriath XI. Unlike the other warriors of the Death Company who spearheaded the planet strike, Lamartis survived the initial landings and, seemingly unstoppable, carved a bloody path through the Orc defenders. Only when the battle was won did the chaplain finally collapse from his wounds. He was brought to the field apothecary inside the now captured fortress there to await the arrival of Astarath, Redeemer of the Lost, and received the gift of final redemption. Yet when Astarath arrived to deliver the chaplain into death's embrace, Lemartis demanded to live, to smite the Emperor's enemies as long as he were able. Such a thing was unheard of. Though Lemartis' eyes were bloodshot and his muscles taut with fury, his words were clear and cogent. Whilst members of the Death Company were often so deranged that Astaroth had to best them in combat before he could take their lives, never before had one challenged him in so lucid a fashion. Quashing all dissent, Astaroth ordered the chaplain placed in stasis and returned to Baal until the chapter's librarians and sanguinary priests could make a full examination of him. This investigation took several months, time in which Lamartis was largely kept in the chill embrace of stasis to ensure the safety of those around him, but the results seemed to reinforce Asarath's hopes. Lamartis was unquestionably in the grip of the Black Rage, for all the physical signs were there, yet his mind was not yet riven with insanity. Through an act of incredible willpower, the chaplain appeared able to hold his madness in check. Several sanguinary priests argued that this was but a temporary respite, and that Lamartis would succumb to the utter depths of madness once removed from stasis, but Astrath was not so sure. Refusing to slay Lamartis, as some of the sanguinary priests wished, he woke the chaplain from his enforced slumber and offered him a way in which he could continue to serve. So did Lamartis become the guardian of the lost and wielder of the ancient Blood Crozius, he has repaid Astaroth's faith a thousand times over, for the Death Company have never been so potent a force as they are under his guidance, their modern glories eclipsing deeds of legend. He leads his charges to ever greater renown, ensuring that the, the dread sacrifice of the Blood Angel's Death Company is never in vain. At battle's end, Lamartis is placed in stasis once more, to slumber through the weeks and months until his bloody talents are required again. For Lamartis, there is no longer any calm before the storm. His life is one of constant battle, for he is awoken when needed and preserved when he is not. 
Lemartis is surely living on borrowed time, for even his formidable willpower cannot keep the Black Rage at bay indefinitely. Yet for the moment at least, the chaplain's iron will holds firm. He is a symbol of hope to a chapter slipping into the darkness. For if Lemartis can continue to reason and serve his chapter within the dark insanity of the Black Rage, perhaps others can do so too. End quote. And who would wish either role? To be a thing lost in time and awoken only to be covered in blood. To lead a group of men who are displaced in time also, and are stripped of all that previously made them noble and pure. Or who would wish to have to deal so with his brothers? To best them in combat and then behead them time and time again. A task without glory, a task without end. No matter how necessary for the survival of the Legion, the chapters and the Imperium entire. Grim dark indeed, I hope you agree. But more than this, the Death Company are actually, in my mind, a perfect picture of the history and degeneration of the Imperium. The death of a dream, where noble crusaders of light are turned to things of barbarity and fury, all because of the first betrayal, the greatest betrayal, the Horus Heresy. The Death Company are the Imperium as it is, as they Primarch, their father, Sanguinius, was what it should have been. Such heart-wrenching irony. I shall leave this entry here, but do please know that we shall see much, much more of the Blood Angels in the near future. Their history, their accomplishments, their burden, and their glory. Also, it will be required to know the Blood Angels intimately, as two of their number now hold more import than near any other standard Astartes alive, Mephiston and Dante, the regent of the dark half of the Imperium. I look forward to this time with relish, but all good things, eh? I have been Voldemort, your faithful servant. If you have enjoyed this introduction to the Death Company, then please do consider liking and subscribing. If you are a regular gentle listener and see the worth in what we do, then please do consider sharing the video or even supporting us on Patreon, if resources permit. Now, no matter what you do today, please do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.